Morning, everyone. Welcome to this medicine webinar with St. Catherine's. We're often known as cats, so probably most of us will be saying cats during this session. Today, giving the webinar is going to be Professor Stefan Marciniak. So I'm going to hand over to him in a moment. And then we've got lots of student helpers who are going to be chipping in with their thoughts and answering your questions as well. Um, so perhaps we could get our student helpers to introduce themselves first and then the members of staff joining us today um, and then it's over to um, Stefan. Hi, um, I'm Alice and I'm a first year medic at GATS. Um, I'm Amelia and I'm in second year. Hi, I'm Jo and um, I'm a third year medic at GATS. I'm Sean, I'm also a third year medic at GATS. Hi, I'm Shivani, I'm a second year medic at GATS. Hi, I'm Srinand and I'm a fourth year medic at CATS. Hi, I'm Stefan, I'm one of the fellows at Matt at <laughs> CATS. Uh, I'm David Bainbridge, uh, I'm uh, the Science Commission's tutor, I'm not a medic, I'm actually a vet, but don't help that against me. And I'm Megan and I'm the admissions administrator. So welcome everybody, it's very strange giving a talk to my laptop, but I understand there are about 50 or more of you there at the moment. I'm um, Professor Stefan Marciniak. I'm actually a medical doctor at the hospital. I look after patients with respiratory diseases. Um, I'm also a fellow at the St. Catharines, which means I'm part of the faculty there and I do a lot of the teaching. Um, I also run something called the MBPhD program, which is special about Cambridge. We can get medical students to intercalate a PhD into their training. And I'll try and talk a little bit about all of these things during the next sort of 20, 25 minutes. Um, and I'm hoping that my medical students will pitch in and um, correct me when I get things wrong. So this is St. Catharines. This is the most beautiful college in Cambridge, I say, um, without any bias. Um, we are about 500 years old, but it's a very medical college. We've been, we, so Addenbrooke's Hospital is, um, Addenbrooke's was a fellow and a student at St. Catharines, um, hundreds of years ago and he left the money for the first uh, med um, hospital in Cambridge to be built. So we're very proud of our medical heritage. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about why you would and why you wouldn't want to apply to Cambridge. Now Cambridge is a very prestigious university. Um, it's, it is challenging to, to be a student here but it's very rewarding. Um, we have a great focus on biomedical sciences. There's a great deal of research done here and a lot of the medical students can participate actively in research. We are break, broken up into colleges. So rather than there being 260 medical students just meeting each other at lectures, we're broken up into 30 colleges. So we have 12, student, 12 medical students per year in St. Catharines and they form a very tight knit group and they support one another. Plus being such a small group, the fellows get to know you very, very well and are able to provide additional support. And hopefully the medical students um, will pitch in and tell you a little bit about this later on. Um, so there is quite an active social life, both in college, college and at the level of the whole university. The accommodation is organised initially within the college. So you actually stay in the college or in college owned premises. Um, Often the team sports and the cultural activities are based around the college and there's a lot of competition between the different 30 colleges. Um, the university provides lots of teaching facilities, but so does individual colleges and St. Catharines, um, we're very proud of the support we give to our medical students. And let's face it, Cambridge is a very beautiful place to live and, and St. Catharines is one of the more beautiful colleges. So, but why might you not want to pick us as a college? We are, we are a great place and a great university, um, but we have a very traditional course. And what I mean is we break up the medical school training, the six years into three years of science and then three years of clinical. You may quite rightly want to be doing patient work right from the first year. And if that's right for you, that m we might not be the right medical school because we like to teach you the science very, very well for the first three years and then let you loose on patients for the next three years. So we have a separate traditional clinical versus um, preclinical course. It is very science-based. We want you not to simply understand what's happening in a disease. We want you to understand the basic science behind that and why we know how that disease is working. And that will, that will future-proof you because much of the medicine that I'm practicing today is very different to the medicine I learned 
25 years ago. But by understanding the basic science, you're future proofed and you can pick up the new advances as, as you go along during your career. We also have very short terms. Our terms are only eight weeks long. Okay, and that compares to 10 or 12 weeks at other medical schools. That means we have to pack an awful lot into a short amount of time. So it is a very intensive course. You have a lot of fun. You do have a lot of extra activities, but you are studying quite hard for the eight weeks of each term that you're in Cambridge. And we expect you to be self-starters. We will do a lot of teaching for you, but we also want you to go away and learn um, a lot of the details by yourself. So St. Catherine's is, is based right in the middle of town. It's very close, about five minutes away from the lectures and the laboratories. And you will still be having to go to laboratories to do practical work, um, even in this age of COVID. Currently, the current year, um, the current new students will be starting in October, will be having many of their lectures online. You'll be starting a year after that, and we really don't know at the moment what the situation will be, but hopefully we'll be able to return to having face-to-face -face lectures. And so you have the advantage of St. Catherine's of being five minutes away. But you get lectures and laboratories at any medical school. What's different about Cambridge is that we have these special sessions called supervisions. Supervision is a small group teaching and what we mean by small group teaching in Cambridge is three or four students in, in a room with a fellow for an hour discussing the topics that they've had lectures on for the last um, week. Some other universities, small group teaching might be 20 of you in a seminar. We don't think that's, that's still a seminar. To us, a, a supervision is three or four of you sitting on that red sofa. That's a picture of the red sofa in my office where you would come every Monday to talk about physiology um, and drink the tea I make you and eat the biscuits. Below are the 12 medical students currently. And I think there's Alice. She's, um, she's one of the students who's going to talk to you in a moment. Um, the, the only reason they're there at, one, at that time is that it was the last supervision and they're all having mince pies with me at the end, uh, just before Christmas. But normally at any one time, there'd only be three of them there um, so they can all get a chance to ask me questions and I get get chance to ask them questions and make sure they understand the lecture material. Again, being a traditional um, medical school, we also still expect you to do dissection. Some medical schools, unfortunately, don't do dissection anymore and you learn the anatomy from a book or from lectures. Here, it's hands, literally hands-on of dissecting um, um, cadavers on a weekly basis um, to learn the anatomy. So St. Catherine's is one of just 30 colleges in Cambridge and all colleges in Cambridge have many good features. We are a beautiful old 500 year old college, very close to the lectures. Uh, we have a, a moderate number of students. So having 12 medical students in a year means that there are, there's a large enough group that you're able to support one another, um, but it's small enough that everybody's able to make friends. Um, you, don't have, you don't get lost in a very large crowd. As I mentioned right at the beginning, we're proud of the fact that Addenbrooke's Hospital is the main hospital in Cambridge, and Addenbrooke's was previously a student and then a fellow at our college. Um, we try to look after you every so often. We give you various slap-up dinners where you can sort of enjoy the Harry Potter experience in, in our beautiful college. And this is the front gate of St. Catherine's. Um, we norm that's normally opened for the graduating students to walk out and, and get their degrees. But this year we didn't have that ceremony because of COVID. So the college arranged for um, a plane to skywrite a heart on the day that our students would be graduating. So this is a, a very favorite um, picture of, that I like. What's different about St. Catherine's compared to maybe some other colleges and certainly compared to some other universities is that you're taught by experts. So, for example, these are, these are some of the faculty in the college who would be teaching you. This is Mike Nicholson. He is professor of transplant surgery, and he's doing lots of research on trying to revive organs that wouldn't normally fit, fit for transplantation. But he, on a weekly basis in these groups of three or four students, would be teaching you anatomy. So you really can't do better than that, except um, if you want to learn the radiology. And Jude Barker is uh, Barber is a consultant radiologist who also helps with um, the, the anatomy teaching. Um, I teach physiology, I'm a, I'm a respiratory consultant, and then Rahul will be teaching pathology, 
Um, Nisha is an ophthalmologist, will be teaching neuroscience. Nick Morell is another medical professor who will look after you when you're doing your clinical training. And Anthony Davenport is professor of clinical pharmacology who will be teaching you pharmacology. So you really get taught by experts in the field. So you need to ask yourself, are you doing the right subjects? We like you to have three sciences, but we, we count maths as a science. So if you have chemistry, biology and maths, that's fine. If you have chemistry, physics and maths, that's fine too. We do like chemistry. Chemistry is, the, your grading chemistry is one of the best predictors of how well you're going to do in the course. Um, our offer in Cambridge for a science subject is always A star, A star, A, unless there is a specific reason why we don't give that grade. But, so typically you'll be expecting A star, A star, A if you're doing A levels and more than 42 for those of you who are doing the IB. One of the questions that we're getting a lot at the moment from students is work experience because normally I'm really asking medical students to do work experience because I don't want you to start a course that you're not going to enjoy and start a career that you're not going to enjoy. So I ask you to go away and determine whether you're going to like looking after people by getting some hands-on experience. That isn't possible now and we accept that isn't possible so don't stress about it. Okay? We, can't, we, don't, we know you're not able to go to nursing homes. We know you're not allowed onto medical wards because of all the COVID restrictions. So we are not going to expect it and we are not going to penalise you for not having the experience. If for some reason you have been able to get experience, that's wonderful. Tell us about it. But it's not going to disadvantage you if you don't have the experience. It's also come to our attention that some people, some um, organisations and some doctors are, are charging online courses to give you online work experience. Please don't fall for that, it's not necessary. Um, if you want to learn about the NHS, you can read the news, you can listen to the radio, you can listen to podcasts, find out about the structure of the NHS, find out what challenges we're facing, and that's something we can talk about at the interviews, but just don't worry about work experience. Okay, so what are the practicalities in applying? We like you to apply well like most medical schools but certainly for all Cambridge subjects you have to apply at the beginning of next term so early October it's the same date for all medical schools I understand we're also one of the medical schools that wants you to have the BMAT exam so make sure that you're you're signed up for one of the the two sittings to take the BMAT when you apply you will then get an acknowledgement from them from um, the university saying that we've got your application and we will start sending out information about interviews. I can tell you the interviews will be the beginning of December. You ought to then start preparing for interviews and the best way to prepare for interviews is really to get somebody, a, 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 a teacher or a distant relative to ask you questions about medicine or your subjects and just get into the habit of being able to discuss comfortably things about medicine things about your subjects. It's not a test of what you know, it's a test of how you think. So get them to ask you questions that you might not have prepared for and see how you talk through them. So how do we select? Um, there are many criteria and there is no one particular cutoff. People believe there must be a magic BMAT or a magic set of um, exam results. It doesn't work like that. It really is a combination of how good your academic results are, how good your, your school reports are, what your personal statement, to some extent, different people put different weight on personal statements. I, I'm more interested in how you do an interview and how you've done in your exams, but some people are, are more interested in the personal statement too. The interview at Cambridge is very important because that's when we get to find out how you think. Uh, and we do look at the BMAT score uh, as a general rule of thumb. We like to see some A stars in your GCSEs, but we don't expect you to be perfect. Some people believe that there's no point in applying to Cambridge unless you've got nine A stars. It doesn't work like that. We would like to see A stars, and we particularly like to see some A stars in sciences, but if you've dropped some, um, some grades, it's not a problem. If you've got a B or a six in, in, in new money, um, that will be discussed at the interview and we'll, and we'll ask what, what's happened. And if you've got a C in any subject, that will definitely come up. But it, it doesn't mean that you won't get an interview and it doesn't mean that you won't get in. If, if it's C in a non-medical, in a non-scientific subject and you have a good reason for it, then it doesn't matter. Um, there are many medical students in Cambridge who've had a C in 
something like geography or Latin, we don't mind. I want you to do well in sciences though. The offer, as I've said, will always be A star, A star, A, or more than 42 in the BMAT, um, um, BMAT sorry, um, in, um, IB. A bland report from your school isn't helpful. So when you're getting this, the, 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 the statement written by your teachers, find somebody who knows you, who can tell us about you and not just tell us about your school. And we want to know about you as an individual, which brings us to the personal statement. Tell us why you want to do medicine, but don't, don't be gushy, but just tell us genuinely why you want to do medicine. Is it the science? Is it the helping people? Is it some personal experience? We're genuinely interested. And there is not necessarily a right answer. Um, what have you done to check that medicine is right for you? You can't do work experience, but you must have done something else. You must have read about it. You might have talked to people. What other achievements have you got? Are you captain of a sports team? Do you help um, students in your school who've got learning difficulties? Just tell us something that you've achieved. And what's interesting to you, which I've put a little asterisk there, is basically what do you want me to ask you about? When you come to interview, you might be quite in, um, nervous, and so I'm going to be wanting to ask you questions that you know a lot about, because you're going to feel comfortable talking about things that you enjoy. So if you tell me about your EPQ or your, what you really enjoy reading in your personal statement, I will know what nice questions to ask you. But whatever you do, be honest. Don't bluff. Don't say that you've read a book that you haven't. Don't say you can speak a language that you don't, because when it comes out to interview, it's just very embarrassing for everybody. The sort of things that we're looking for from a personal statement is we want to see that you're a compassionate person and I want you to look after my patients, um, that you're optimistic and you're going to be able to you know, survive a, a challenging career in medicine. We want to see some enthusiasm that you really want to study this subject, that you're flexible. Um, very, very important that you're trustworthy. Because I, when I go home at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I need to know that the junior doctors who are looking after the patients on my ward are going to be completely honest and tell me if something goes wrong. Um, and then the others are obvious. Are you imaginative? Are you organized? Some negatives are pretty obvious. Rigid in, intolerance. Anybody who comes across as intolerant of people based on their gender, religion, sexual orientation, that's really not that's not compatible with a career in medicine. So please don't come across as rigid or intolerant. Again, any dishonesty is a huge mark against you. Um, we don't want you to be very introvert that we can't get information out of you, but we don't want you to be so extra extrovert that we feel intimidated during the interview. Um, and again, disorganization is, is, is a mark against you too, because you have so little time in an eight week course to get through all the subject. I won't talk very much about the BMAT because I suspect you know more about the BMAT than I do because you, you might have started studying for it. And if you haven't, you probably would want to start studying now. Um, there is no magic BMAT number. Um, it's just another piece of information that we use in the selection process. The interviews are very important to us um, and they, it might be the first interview you've ever had and we will take account of that. Um, and it's entirely fine to be nervous. We will do everything we can to settle you down. Normally we have face-to-face -face interviews and it isn't 100% clear whether we'll be able to do face-to-face uh, -face interviews this December or not. And if we don't do face-to-face -face interviews, we'll have, to, uh, um, we'll have to have an interview via Zoom. And this is a mock-up of, of um, Amelia being interviewed by me and David. Um, we will try to put you at your ease. They'll be at the beginning of December and you will have two interviews with two people in each. And the reason we have two, so there's a science interview. So I do one of the interviews with, um, with uh, Professor Davenport and I ask various lots of science questions and maths questions. Whereas Prof Nick Morell and Mike Nicholson will be asking about what you know about the health service, what you know about the causes of disease. What we're actually looking for is how teachable you are. Are you really enthusiastic? Are you going to participate in supervisions? There are lots of ways of learning medicine and one of the special ways in Cambridge is of having supervisions. But if you're going to be, if you're not really going to enjoy the supervisions, if you're not going to participate, we might not be the best place for you. So we really want to get 
a, a sense from these interviews as whether you're going to be participating during supervisions. We want to know if you can cope with your ideas being challenged, um, as might happen in the lively discussions we have in supervisions. So, you know, we will have a lively discussion when we interview you. Um, and we want to see that you're motiv motivated. We want to see that spark that you're really going to enjoy studying medicine here in Cambridge. So how do we make the decisions? Um, imagine we have a large number of applications, and we do. We, are, we have a quota. Each college has a particular sized quota. Uh, but very often when we've done our interviews, there are a few people we know we're going to make offers to, but there are a large number we believe should be in Cambridge, but probably exceeds our quota. And the reason, and the way we get around that is we then discuss with all the other colleges, because it's very likely that one year we have slightly too many good students, whereas another college will have insufficient numbers of good students, and we can exchange ideas, and we can then encourage another college to make an offer or poss possibly re-interview one of our students, and that's called the pool. So just because a large number of students apply to one college, it doesn't disadvantage you, because if you're a good student, you'll be, the other colleges will be made aware of you. So we have 11 to 12 places to do medicine in, in St. Catharines per year out of the 260 in Cambridge. We get about 80 applications and we interview half of you. Um, our pooled students, and we put a lot of students in the pool, a lot of our students often get taken out of the pool by other colleges. Um, so after an interview, you might get a letter saying you've been offered a place. You might say, we're not offering you a place and you haven't got into the pool but if we do do that we'll give you feedback as to what went wrong in the interview and what you might want to improve next time when you're interviewed at an, another medical school so it will be a, a beneficial experience for you if you've been pooled you might not know about it until you get an offer from another college or the other college may ask you for a second interview that it varies from college to college but it will all be decided by january Okay, I've nearly finished. So the course, we have a three years of preclinical science. The first year we get through anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, which have these strange names. Second year, you get through pathology, pharmacology, and a bit more physiology. So the neuroscience and the reproductive physiology. The third year is up to you. Um, most people decide to do a third year specialising one of those other sub in one of those other sciences. But really, there's a huge um, curriculum open to you. Some people decide to do a year of law, and you can pass all of the law exams in your third year. Or some people decide to do engineering. These are all open to you. Um, so, but it's entirely up to you what you do in your third year. Then, when you come to clinical school. Um, it's the first year as a fourth year student is a uh, fourth year in medicine, but first year in clinical training is you learn the, the core basics of medicine, how to do examinations, some of the fundamentals of disease. The second year you go into some of the subspecialties and the third year in the clinical school, you start applying it to patient care. But we have what's called a, a spiral curri curriculum. You keep coming back to the same subject. So you'll do some pediatrics in the first year and in the second year and in the third year of the clinical course. So we find that's the best way to reinforce your learning. And so, very, and so finally, we've talked about the clinical um, course, which is those three years. We also have an MBPhD programme for about 10 students per year can choose to intercalate a PhD into their clinical training. That extends the course from six years to nine years, but you come out as a fully trained clinician scientist and we will actually pay for your PhD. If you're not sure you want to do medicine, but you thought you might prefer chemistry, I would recommend you do the subject you really want to do. And if after three years of chemistry, you decide you actually did want to do medicine, we have a four year graduate course. So you can come back and do the whole of medicine in four years. So actually in seven years, you'll have the first degree that you were interested in, and then the four years of medicine. So it isn't at that much longer to do the graduate course medicine. So there are multiple ways of becoming a doctor. So I've gone 40 seconds over my time, so I'm gonna stop now um, and stop sharing my screen. And Catherine, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, we've had various questions that came in during that time. Some of them we've um, been able to answer, but some of them are ones which um, it would be great if, if you, Stefan, and the students are able to, to answer. Let's go with some of the questions about intercalating. So um, can you intercalate in non-medical subjects, for example, a language or something completely different to medicine? Do you want me to have a go at that one? David, do you want to start with that? Uh, yes, uh, technically you can do any third year subject uh, in your intercalated year. There are some subjects where that's a lot easier than others. So there's some subjects which are kind of designed for it. So if you wanted to do say management studies uh, or something like that, then that's doable. Um, and there's things like geography and human social political studies where I think you could do it. Um, a couple of people specifically asked about languages. I think they'd definitely be deep towards the difficult end of the spectrum because you would then be in competition with people who'd done French and Spanish for two years at Cambridge. Which So in some subjects, technically you can do it, but it'd be very, very difficult. Other subjects, much more straightforward. But there's a great option there. And so in, when you go to the clinical course, there are, there are two or three sections in the curriculum during the three years, six week blocks are called SSE, student selected components. You do one in the first year of clinical, in the second year and the third year. People often use those to do a bit of research or, or, or specializing in, a, in one of the medical subjects they, love, they care about, but some of them spend those six week blocks just learning a language. And you can then actually go down the, um, the, Cambridge, the, the language department. It's not a degree, but the language department will actually run special intensive language courses for clinical students. I don't know if any of the, um, who's, have we got a fourth student? Fourth year, who's, um, Srinan, do you have any experience of that? So I personally didn't do one of the CULP courses, but I know a lot of my friends who did. So they were offered in the first term of our fourth year. So alongside when we were learning the more basic examinations and things like that. And uh, we had a, uh, definitely enough time outside the course to attend these language courses. They happened twice a week for a period of six, six weeks or something. And lots of people benefited from that and got, you know, from beginner level to a really almost fluent Spanish. Or if they started an intermediate course, then they said they really improved their, their language levels. Brilliant. Um, we've got some more questions and I'll just quickly say at this stage as well, um, things to do with admissions, you might see some of us typing away. So some of the more specific questions we can answer by typing. Um, but those kind of questions, we're always happy to answer by email as well. So please do take advantage of this like time um, to actually chat to, to our students and hear their um, opinions as well on the course and the college in Cambridge. Um, so we've got a question lost it now in all the questions. Um, what's it like studying medicine at CATS? So what's the best thing about studying medicine at CATS? Well, I think you should ask the students that one. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, so I definitely say that we've got such a friendly and quite a big CATS community who like the people who study medicine. So our med socks. So people in the years above are so happy to help you out. So I know I've reached out to like my college mum or like Amelia, or people in the year above. Like Please, can you tell them what a college mum is? Oh, so um, when you come to any college, I think, but especially at St. Catharines, you're given a college family. So you would marry someone in your year group who either does your course or any other course. And then the following year later, you're given a kid who does the same subject, but is in the year below. So it's kind of a link so that you have a relationship and someone you can kind of always go to um, for advice and stuff like that. But that, that's purely for support. It, it, it is not a, a relationship thing, just clarify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would definitely say um, our cat's med sock is one of the best things about St. Cat's for medicine. Shivani? Um, I think I mostly agree with Alice, to be fair, like Cat's med sock is really lovely, um, especially the events throughout the year and all the talks and things I really enjoyed. And I do think that because um, it's not too big a college, you really get a sense of like community within the CATS medics and you know everyone really well in other year groups, which is really nice, I think, to be able to get to know everyone. Um, I would also say that I like how CATS has, um, I like the supervisions at CATS, I think, because I know some colleges have supervisions much less frequently. 
And I quite like that we get to know our supervisors quite well over the course of the year and see them very regularly, because I think that supervisions are probably the most important way in which you learn at Cambridge and you get the most out of them probably. So I think those are the best parts of CATS. Someone's asked, is there anything you wish you knew before coming to CATS to study medicine? Not to kind of copy the last answers, but I think I just wish I'd have known how like chill it was going to be. Like I thought it was going to be really stressful and there'd be lots of competition and I'd be like really struggling to keep up with everyone else who had done like a million A levels. Um, and I was just really worried. Like everyone's nervous before they go to uni, but I feel like I wish I'd have known that it was going to be fine. Like everyone was going to be so friendly and there's so much support and it's actually really fun. Like it's enjoyable. It's not stressful. Um, so yeah, I just wish I'd have like enjoyed my first few weeks a bit more and been less stressed all the time. <laughs> Someone's asked, what would you say is the biggest difference between Oxford and Cambridge? So that's perhaps tricky for us to answer, seeing as we're all um, at Cambridge. But Stefan, do you know anything particularly with medicine? The difference well, is apart from we're so much better. No, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, they're a bit older. We're actually the younger brother or the younger sister of, of Oxford. It was actually Cambridge was set up 800 and something years ago by some people who left Oxford in a huff. Um, and, and we've really never got over the, the, um, the falling out. Actually, it, there's a healthy rivalry. It's a, it's a very good um, university over in Oxford. Um, it's got some disadvantages. One of them is that their hospital is right in the middle. Of, they've got two hospitals right in the middle of town, surrounded by buildings. Cambridge, the first, the Addenbrooke's hospital was, is in the middle of town, but then very cleverly in the 60s, it was moved to a fancy new facility on the edge of Cambridge. So Addenbrooke's has now grown into Europe's biggest biomedical campus, which has lots of research institutes, lots of high-tech companies, um, so probably in terms of biomedical startup and biomedical research, we might have a slight edge. We also, 30 years ago, set up an MD-PhD program that's combining PhDs and medical training. Um, and so we've got the, the oldest MD-PhD program in, um, in Europe. And I don't think Oxford even has one now. Um, so if you want to do a PhD as part of your training in Oxford, and they call it a DPhil, you, you, it's much, it's, it's much less straightforward than it is in Cambridge. But it's a good, it's a good, it's a reasonably good university. Is it still true that um, Oxford doesn't do dissection, they do protection, whereas we do dissection? Because I've been, to, I, I think that's I one of the. Oh, I don't know that. That's if that's true, that's one of the major um, differences with medical course because um, Professor Marchenek has just talked about how how dissection is uh, is from from the get go in in year one, one of the ways that you learn anatomy. And that was, I guess, one of the main reasons that I chose to apply to Cambridge. Um, as well as prosections and textbooks is a good way to learn anatomy. And Cambridge also does use prosections. You don't really get the feel of what it's, all the complexity and just what, what it's like, um, just like in, in the body or how things fit together. Um, in textbooks, it's always very pretty and all very colourful. Um, I've actually made a prosection and prosections are quite accurate because they are made from a real specimen but you also do have to make compromises because the real thing is just so complex um so i would say if you're at all interested in becoming a surgeon doing di learning by dissection which as was mentioned before is starting to become rare amongst universities is is quite vital um we've had some questions about getting involved in things outside of the course so are there opportunities for medical students to get involved in university or college sports or other extracurriculars? Uh, huge amounts. And Alice? Um, yeah, there's loads of opportunities. So like I play lacrosse for cats on the weekends um, and sometimes do netball. And also the good thing about college sports and societies is they're really, really flexible. So if there's one week that you can't make a match or training because you've got work to do or other commitments, it's really easy to say no because everyone's in the same boat and everyone understands what's going on. But I would definitely say doing a society or a sport or music is just a great outlet and to get away from studying your degree. Um, so yeah. 
But also, if there's anything you're interested in and there isn't a club, the college will usually provide money for you to set up a club. And I think on this, Srinand has a very good story. There was the, um, the, 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 the cookery one or the smooth. Oh, I see. So Smoothie Society. Yeah. So there's a, I think this happened a couple of years before me, actually, but Smoothie Society is now a really, really big thing at CAPS. So every Sunday, lots of people meet up in the JCR uh, for an hour and just blend some fruit together and have smoothies or milkshakes. And it was something that people in the couple of years above me just started as a very low key thing and it got more and more popular. And then the college threw their support behind it. They now have a weekly budget to go and buy as much fruit or chocolate or cream or whatever else they need to buy. And it's now, you know, it's, it's something that I really enjoyed going to while I was living in college. It's a nice, you know, hours break on a Sunday afternoon. And yeah, that's a very popular thing. So all these kinds of um, ideas that people have for um, activities, they're very well supported by the college and medics definitely have time to get involved. I can confirm the Smoothie Society is still going strong as I, I was the president running it um, this, <laughs> this year. Um, so yeah, um, it, it's just a very good time to just get away from the library and um, also get some vitamins as well. Um, and it's all, as Renan said, funded by the college. So there's people sort of at the, at the freshest week. So at the start of the year, there is, um, there's both a freshest fair um, and a freshest squash in the college. So that's for university and college accommodation. I'm not really sure what's going to happen this year, but hopefully there will be some means to introduce you to all these new societies. And so I was in charge of making spoofies there and getting, drawing in the new members of college. Um, and yeah, so they, they really enjoyed it. I can, I can also comment on music as well. So I've been involved in a lot of music outside of my medical course. And again, as uh, my colleagues were saying with sport, there's a lot of variety in terms of the commitment. So CATS has a group called CATS Appella, which is a really informal a cappella group that meets up in the chapel once a week. And again, that's the kind of thing where if I had work one week, I didn't need to go and it could be arranged around my supervisions and things. Uh, but then there's also some really high level music making, both in the university and the college itself. So in my third year, when I was doing my intercalated degree and it was still a lot of work, but I had a bit more flexibility with my time. Uh, I joined chapel choir for a year and, um, got a lot out of that so again there's lots of different things you can get involved in and it um yeah all different kind of commitment levels we've had i mean we've in terms of students i can think of lots of people who've played for the university so when you play at different universities you, if you for those subjects you can get something called a blue so even though medics are really hard working and have lots to do it's not unusual for medics and cats to also play for the college or play for the university and get a blue in various sports. And um, we've had a few questions about the style of the King's course. So to any students, especially those who started the clinical course, how do you feel the more traditional method of learning medicine has benefited you? And kind of similar to that, people are asking, um, how do you find the kind of clinical experience that's offered in the first three years, maybe compared to other universities? So Sean, do you want to tell about the first year of clinical and then maybe some of the first or second years can talk about what little, you do get some clinical experience in the first couple of years. I, 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 yeah. Well, actually, so it's Srinand was in the fourth year, sorry. That's all right. Yeah, so I, as I say, I'm in my fourth year, so I just started my first year of clinical medicine and definitely, so there's, not so much clinical experience in the first three years, although there is some, as I think other medical students will tell you about, but there's a lot in the fourth year. You know, from the fourth year, you are very much integrated in hospital teams. You have some weeks of, you know, maybe four or five weeks a year of purely lecture-based learning. The rest of it is all embedded in hospitals. There's a lot of emphasis on learning on the job. And you, there's also a big emphasis on a variety of experiences. So each year you spend some time in Adderbrook's hospital, but also some time in another regional hospital. And that changes every year. So I spent, you know, before we were sent home because of COVID, I spent quite a lot of time at Ipswich Hospital. And that's, in, you know, a district general hospital. It's a very different experience to uh, Adderbrook's hospital. And you get put in lots of different rotations. So you get, you start off with a block called core clinical medicine, which is basically getting you used to being embedded in a clinical team, which I found really, really helpful. So you weren't expect, there's no specific things you had to learn. It was just about you getting used to walking up to patients and talking to them, asking if you could practice your examinations on them, you know, uh, what ward rounds are like, what clinics are like and things. And then you started more um, specific blocks on medicine, on surgery, on emergency medicine and, th and GP and things like that. And that continues uh, throughout the three years of clinical medicine. So there's a lot once you get to clinical school. 
And Serena, do you want to say a word about supervisions when you're at the clinical school? Okay, so again, we do still have supervisions at clinical school, but of course, because we're learning more about applied clinical medicine, the structure of the supervisions changes to suit what we're supposed to learn in clinical school. So we have a, a clinical supervisor who is either a foundation year doctor, so someone in their first two years of practicing medicine, or maybe a, a specialist trainee. So someone in their first maximum three or four years of practicing medicine. So they know what it's like to be a medical clinical medical student and what we need to learn. And they take a small group again, it's usually about five or six of us. So it's still a very small group. And we go to one or two patients and one or two of us do an examination as practice. And then they comment and give us feedback on that. Uh, so yeah, it's very similar in terms of a small group teaching, very focused on the individual. But of course, it's more practical because we're learning more practical things at this stage. Someone's very specifically asked is for activities to get involved in, is that too much outside of your medicine course? So perhaps a couple of you could speak about that. So it obviously completely depends on you and like how much time you want in bed and like just chilling in your room and hanging out with friends. But you can definitely do a lot. I mean, I started rowing this year for the first time ever and training was like six times a week or something crazy. So obviously you could do six things that meet once a week and it would still be the same amount of work. Um, I also went climbing every week. Um, and like lots of my friends get involved in like ball committees and societies where they have to do a lot of like administration work. So it really, really does depend on like how you schedule your time and how much you're willing to commit. But four is quite arbitrary, but definitely sounds manageable to me. I know a lot of people that do that kind of thing. Um, medicine's quite contact hour heavy, but that doesn't mean that you're working way more than someone who does like history or something. It just means that you're doing more structured work, like you have to be somewhere at a certain time rather than like work in the library and you have to like write essays by yourself. So it's not like you're going to be working way harder than everybody else. Um, and everyone manages to have fun and do their degree at the same time. So don't worry about not having time to do things. I think I found um that your work kind of just um, like your work will take as long as you have for it. So if you commit to a few extracurricular things a week um, and kind of have them scheduled in, then your work will just fit around that and you'll always manage to uh, meet the deadlines. Um, for me, I also used to take a day off each week. I did find that completely possible. I just would schedule it into my week and it would just be a day to kind of relax, enjoy being with friends. And then I'd kind of reset for another week of work. And I found that totally possible um, to meet the deadlines and to do that and to do some extracurricular things. It's, definitely possible even as a medical student and I think it probably makes you do better in work as well to have that kind of balance. In, in fact I was um, helping to run four different societies in uh, this year that I just passed um, so I um, was a president of the CATS Med Soc, um, I was a president of the Spruva Society at CATS, um, I also was involved in two university societies so we newly set up an, an anatomy society which is still quite new and quite small um, and uh, sports wise, I was also on the committee for the University Rifle Club. Um, so as I, I completely agree that if you don't do activities, you tend to, um, your work will tend to fill up the time. Um, and if you do more activities, you, I, the impression I get is that you will just become more efficient and you will get used to time management. And I think it's quite a nice, a nice thing to do. And so it can sometimes feel overwhelming. You can also step back from these um, and say like, look, I'm just a bit, bit too too worn out. And because everyone's in the same boat, everyone will, will um, understand if you do that. Thanks guys. Um, I think David's going to answer um, by speaking some of the even more common admissions questions that we've had coming in. Uh, yes, there were just a few specific ones uh, that came in. Uh, one was about the timing of the BMAT relative to when you apply, and one was about people who were thinking of taking um, A-levels on paper at some stage in the autumn. Um, the BMAT, I mean, many people do the November sitting of the BMAT. I think the great majority do, so most people apply before they know their BMAT result. So that's obviously absolutely fine if people uh, do that. Um, that's what most people do anyway. Um, if you don't get the grades, if you're doing your A-levels or what were due to be doing your A-levels this summer and don't get the grades in the system that's happening this year, sort of the emergency system that's happening this year, and you decide to take your um, A-levels in the autumn, then that's absolutely fine by us. If you think that the summer assessment was wrong, that you'll do better on paper, that's absolutely fine. Again, you won't know your results by the time you apply 
no. Um, somebody asked about doing two sciences plus psychology. We don't, t in, in our preference for three science math subjects, we don't normally count um, psychology as one of those, I'm afraid. And, and, and the statistics show that if you're doing just two science and math subjects, it is quite a lot harder to get into Cambridge because there's so many people who are applying who are doing three. Further maths is a bit different. We often do uh, value and use uh, further maths. Finally, somebody was asking about the status of EU applicants, whether, of, as you know, they're not eligible for home fees um, for those starting after for in 2021 or after. They're asking, do they have to fill in a COPA when they apply, which is a thing which overseas students currently have to do. We don't know the answer to that yet, uh, but we hopefully we will by the time you apply. Uh, and also, you'll know that the university has very strict quotas on currently non-EU applicants. They take only 21 of those a year. And somebody asked, will that be for EU people as well, that very small number of places? I'm afraid we don't know the answer to that question yet. So uh, a couple of post-Brexit things that really just haven't been cleared up. OK, I'm going to shut up now. Thanks, David. Um, somebody's asked, did you have any mis well preconceptions about St Catharines and or Cambridge when you were applying? And do you think that they were disproven when you got there? I, um, I went to like a non-selective state school and they only let me do three A-levels. So I was really concerned coming to Cambridge that I'd be like a lot behind everyone else, like, like academically, and I wouldn't have loads of people that I knew from school there. Um, but that's really not the case. If they give you an offer and they want you to come and study there, they think that you're going to be able to handle the workload. And for the most part, that's definitely true. So just because you've not come from like a really supportive school environment where you get lots of help from teachers and you get lots of homework and stuff, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to manage the workload at Cambridge because they really like, even if you are struggling, they have the support there for you and they do ease you into it. So don't feel like because of your background, you're not going to fit in because that's the one thing mainly that I found to not be true about Cambridge. Um, I think when I came as well, I thought that the relationship with supervisors would be like super intimidating and that I'd be really scared to talk to supervisors about um, if I was struggling or if I had questions or if I didn't feel like I could manage the work on time. But I found that, that really wasn't the case and that my supervisors in both first year and second year have been really approachable. And if I was struggling with the work or didn't understand materials, I could just tell them that I didn't understand what was going on. And I, I wasn't expected to kind of deal with it on my own, but was given the support to work through it with them. And they helped me to understand what I was doing, basically. So yeah, I think it's really nice that supervisors aren't as intimidating as you might think they are. Um, a few questions about the different societies at CATS, a few about the MedSoc, so the Medicine Society. Um, what is it? What does it involve? What do you guys do and how often do you meet? So I was just about to answer some questions there. Um, so the yeah, so the MedSoc is um, is so all, all medical students and vet students in the college are automatically part of the college MedSoc, um, and there's also a, a university-wide MedSoc. But I, I won't go into that. Um, so the college MedSoc um, were funded by the college to provide certain events throughout the year. So we tend to host about around like three or so per term. So these are major events. Um, at the start of term, obviously, there's some welcome events. We had some uh, some very fun ones um, organised by Amelia this um, at the start of last year um, to get the basically to get all the the um, new students to get to know each other, everyone be able to uh, introduce themselves. Um, and so these social events are quite nice. Um, there's because it's funded. There's there's free food for everyone as well. Um, and there's also um, some talk events. So these uh, are from a, a, a very wide range of um, people. So we get external speakers um, for some of the events. Um, and sometimes these are people who have been very successful in the medical field. Um, and they can give some very valuable lessons about their experience and some interesting insights into their research. Um, and also we get students to talk about their experiences. So we also had an event for um, people who did things over the summer, like re summer programs and research um, to talk about that. And also um, the clinical, uh, the medical electives. So that, that's the clinical students who do do something for a few weeks abroad um, to experience a different health system. Um, and so these are all things that, um, that these are all talks um, that are 
well, have been very interesting. Um, and on top of that, we also have uh, regular welfare meetings. Um, so that's just a time for everyone to come together and just chat and you can you can like complain about things in your course and you can um, just chat about how well things are going. There's some like biscuits and stuff and some snacks. Um, so yeah, I think these are some very nice um, things and it's a really nice addition to uh, the experience of being a medic at CATS. Um, something to add, um, those, all the welfare meetings that we do, they take place in this room called the Medical Resource Room. And that's something that's quite special at CATS. So it's just a room for medics and vets where we can kind of all go and um, like learn together. Um, there, are, there are human skeletons, there's resources and books there, and you can print things there. So it's just quite a nice space for medics and vets to hang out or do work together. We've had a few questions about kind of pastoral care at Cambridge. Perhaps one of you could just quickly speak a bit about how you feel supported by CATS and Cambridge during your time, if you ever feel, feel um, overwhelmed as a, as a medical student. We all get a, um, assigned a tutor at the college and that's um, someone who um, probably uh, is not um, a medic. Um, and we have tutor meetings with them um, at least once a term um, and they'll just ask us kind of general um, welfare things, see how we're doing um, and we can get in touch with them at any point in the college um, about anything kind of um, like finance related or course related, anything like that um, and they're really supportive and then there's support within medicine so um, each year you have a director of studies um, and so they um, provide a source of academic support um, and so they're the person to go to um, if you're struggling with any aspect um, relating to academics or actually anything else they'd be happy to um, talk to you um, and then there's um, lots within the college like the um, college family system that we mentioned earlier we found that to be um, a really good source of support um, and yeah lots of welfare resources within the college as well and um, there's this kind of student welfare rep um, on the college committee um, and then yeah there's lots of like there's really so many um, places uh, to go to and um, yeah, the college are really keen on, on pushing welfare um, and uh, advising you um, kind of where to look for welfare support, depending on what your um, challenges are at college. And also just, I found um, friends to be such a great source of support. And I think CATS is, I found it really easy to make friends there. And they're often the first people I turn to um, if I need help with anything. If you Google about French friends and cats is, is, is the cliche is that the world is a friendly college and people actually come here and they're amazed and it's actually true. Um, it is, it's a sort of friendly informal college. But in terms, I'm a director of studies for the first year. So as well as teaching physiology, I would meet one to one with each student at the beginning and the end of each term to go through reports that they've had or problems. If they've got any problems with any of their systems, we can make sure uh, the, um, any of their supervisions or anything we can help ac academically. They also can meet regularly with a tutor and they can say things to the tutor which would be completely kept away from me. So, if, you know, if, if, if there was something they didn't want their medical fellows to know, we have structures to make sure that you have somebody to talk to completely independently. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've got a few questions about how does CATS and our Cambridge um, support students um, to apply for the AFP? So uh, academic foundation program. So um, I, I'm not sure about the one the, the, the I, I direct the MB PhD program, which um, I said every year we have about between six and 10 students doing PhDs because um, all of our students come out with a PhD and lots of publications, usually several publications, they find the academic foundation posts their their head and shoulders above everybody else to get to get in. Having said that, lots of stu most students don't do the MB PhD program, and there are still they still have a very su good success rate for AFPs. So, for example, um, during your SSCs, when you can do those three those six week blocks where you can do some research, it's possible to contribute to other research. Which means by the time you come apply to apply to AFPs, it's very likely as a clinical student you may still you have got already got publications. And having publications and research experience makes getting an AFP easier to, easier to do. Yeah, I can comment. So I've, I've done an SSC in a sort of more um, researchy kind of area. So I did looked at uh, clinical oncology and one of the clinical oncologists at Adam Brooks is developing this radiotherapy model basically to look at 
uh, you know, predict radiotherapy demand and predict how much it will cost and things. And is, uh, so I helped to contribute to that. And there's progress going on with that model now, and it might um, might lead to a, a publication later. Also, lots of the doctors at Addenbrooke's are helping us to write reviews and things. So there's lots of support for people who want to get involved in research, get up publications. Uh, I've, uh, there's uh, lots of support right from the preclinical years as well, but definitely the SSC program is a great opportunity to get involved in that stuff. And all that is very helpful if you want to get, get an AFP place or... Uh, and also there's the MB PhD program, which of course is you know very helpful if you want to get involved in academia. And Srinan, you spent two months working in my lab during one summer as well. I did, yeah. So that was in my first year and I wanted to, to get some research experience right from that age. And Professor Marciniak was very kind and uh, helped me to uh, do a research placement in his lab for two months. And it was a really, really useful experience. Even before coming to his lab, we together applied for some funding from a place called the Genetic Society. And so they basically paid for me to live in Cambridge for those two months and paid for the research materials that we needed to do the project. Uh, it was a fruit fly genetics project. So I learned a lot about genetics, which is a really an area that was really interesting to me. I got a real feel for what lab work is like, you know, right at that young age. And also as part of my genetics um, funding, genetic society funding, I got to go to Edinburgh for a, a few days and present my project to other students my age who are doing a similar thing to me so all those opportunities are available lots of people if you if you just ask people are really really willing to help at all levels and yeah there's definitely lots of opportunities to get involved in research and all that is helpful for people who want to apply for AFPs. It's fun and it also looks good on the CV. Yeah absolutely yeah I, I had a great time doing it as well it's not just for the CV. No no I'm just saying it but it also looks good on the CV. You yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a win-win exactly. <laughs> I realise it's Oh, I was just going to say, we'll, we'll run slightly over, but if it's okay with everyone to stay um, a little bit longer, then, then maybe we can make sure we ask and um, we answer the rest of the questions. Sean, did you want to add something to the AFP? Uh, I was just going to add that um, the, um, I feel that depending on what you do in third year, intercalation can also give you a really good introduction into um, research. Um, so you, uh, this is my um, project that I've uh, sent off. Um, and so it, it gave me a lot of, um, a, a lot of experience with how how sort of publications are sort of written and how I write up a, a scientific work in a formal way. Um, this has actually been sent off for, for publication, so this is also a good good platform. Um, just it, in the in the third year itself. Sean, um, we've got a few questions about personal statements, which would be great to answer. So, um, what would you say really stands out in the personal statement? Is there a way to stand out? Um, and how would you recommend showing enthusiasm in a personal statement? I, I would, well, David is probably better. I, I, I often say this and, and I can see um, Catherine looking anxious because she knows I'm, I usually say personal statements aren't important. Because you're, the application process here has several people involved, some people are very interested in personal statements, some people are less interested. And I'm more interested in the interview and I'm more interested in your results. But I would say I do read the personal statement really as a clue to ask, to find nice questions to ask you. Um, I would avoid gushy, sort of overly emotional, you know, I had a dream, da, da, da. But if you genuinely are interested in something, that will come out in when you're writing around a subject. If you're enthusiastic, that will come out. But I think David's probably a better person to talk about this. Uh, well, I mean, really, that's absolutely right. We, we tend not to try to assess the quality of your personal statement because we know how much you know, people get completely different amounts of help writing a personal statement. Uh, as Stefan said, the main thing is uh, think, picking things off it to talk to you about, and how you talk about things is very, very important, but actually what's on the statement, not quite so much. Um, the, the one thing I would say is the personal statement can be incredibly important for some of the other medical schools you're applying to. So I would actually target it at other places and just give us a few things that you want you might want us to ask you about an interview. The one thing I would say is don't just have a list of things you've done or things you've read. Leave it, maybe trim a few things out so to give yourself time to reflect on each thing so you can say whether you liked it, why you liked it, why you found it interesting. Make it more personal and reflective. Um, someone's asked which of the mega schools, if any, deliver teaching in a similar way to Oxbridge? Um. Oxford breaks it up. Um, I'm not sure which. So I, 
I perhaps they mean kind of with like the supervisions and the. Sort no, of the, the supervision system is very is only Oxford and Cambridge because Durham has a collegiate system, um, but they don't do medicine. I think I think you have to if you're up there you have to go to Newcastle. So I think you're for supervisions you're you're stuck with Oxford and Cambridge, for breaking up into a traditional course that, um, with with um, two or three years of science followed by. Um, followed by three years of clinical that a lot of the London um, places like UCL have a, have, a, have a more traditional course to us. And, but in some of those other London medical schools, you have the option whether you do that third year. In Cambridge, you have to do a third year and we make you do an interclade third year and get a degree out of it before going to clinical school. Some of the other medical schools, you, have, you do two years of basic science and then you have the choice of doing a third year and that that's true in lots of the london medical schools i would contrast it with somewhere like nottingham which is great but in nottingham you'll be doing blood pressures and examining patients right from the first year which is not what we do someone's asked to what level of detail are we expected to know about things we mentioned in the personal statement and um, to talk about in the interview if if you say you t if you Okay, real story. Somebody said, I really like reading contemporary Japanese literature, which is, seems, a, 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 as you know, just that's one thing. And, and I said, that's such a, that's such a surprise, because me too, who's your favorite author? And they said, Haruki Murakami. I said, you'll get away, that's my favorite. The person had read one book. Um, and that was just an unnecessary, awkward situation to find out the person was claiming to be interested in something they weren't. I would just, if you're interested in reading a particular genre, tell me about that and, and have some depth to it. Just don't make anything up. If you're talking about your EPQ, you will almost certainly know more about the subject than I do. Um, a couple of questions which I think um, David and Stefan are probably best placed to answer. Um, the first one, what is a trend you notice in successful candidates? So for example, like is it um, personal statements, interview performance, what are the trends you notice? Um, and also a second question, what is the, the state school to independent school divide like um, at Cambridge, especially in medicine? David, you wanna go first or? Um, I think, I mean, the trends, I mean, I think the two things for medicine for us would be clear, strong aptitude in math slash science. And the other one would be, I think, probably, I would say, I mean, Stefan can disagree with this because he's, he's actually in the interviews, would be for any work experience that you have done or any further research, it's not just what you've done, it's how thoughtful you were about what you did, uh, thinking about how you communicated with people, how interactive you were, whether you went off and looked up things that you saw to see what they meant, how you thought about the people who worked there, what their working life was like, uh, and also a little bit, did you get any sense of how well or badly the organisation you worked in uh, functioned? I'd say those are probably the two main things. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, I like people who are good at maths, but, but some of the students on this, I'm looking at some people, I'm, I'm, um, aren't necessarily all mathematicians. Chemistry is a really, people, if people are very good at chemistry, chemistry is a nice balance of having to remember a lot of stuff and having to understand it. Um, and that really summarizes medicine, I think. Um, physics, you, you can probably just understand it, not necessarily memorize it. And biology, you can probably just memorize it and not understand it. Whereas chemistry is a nice combination of those two. Um, but when, when I said we make the decision based on a whole variety of things, you've got some people who are really good at, at the maths and very good at BMAT and interview okay. Other people do less well in the written exams and interview very, very well. We, it's a real mixed economy. We all t there's no one size fits all and we will take people who are good at various things so so just play to your own strengths um, we also realize that when it comes to the work experience some people have assisted in operations because their friends brothers whatever had let, lets them into an operating theater whereas other people um, their work experience was um, helping the school nurse it's all equally valid there is no, we, 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 don't, we don't say that, you know, one person has done better work experience. It's really, as David said, is what you've thought about it. Um, so, so this idea of social capital, because you've got access to better work experience, if you've got access, that does not, that does not count. And we do take it into account. Um, overall, Oxbridge isn't great 
um, I think it's so two thirds of people from Oxbridge um, are generally, so Oxford slightly lower than Cambridge, but in Cambridge it's about two thirds or more have been to a state school. I would say in St. Catharines we do, we, we, we have a slightly more realistic, uh, i.e. much higher than two thirds of state school. So we do have people who've been to private schools, but most of our students have been to state schools. I think that's true of most Cambridge colleges, but D David can tell me if I've got all the numbers wrong. Uh, no, that's right. I mean, we're, uh, St. Catharines, across all subjects, we're normally around three quarters, so 73 to 77 percent of our UK students are, are from state schools. Um, medicine, I should think, is probably pretty much typical, so it'd be around there, I'd have thought. One thing we have noticed in recent years is um, the, that the percentage of um, state school applicants and percentage of state school entrance onto the course is almost exactly the same. So your chances of getting in don't seem to be affected by what school type you're at. Thank you. I think we've just got a couple of very niche questions left. Um, and then that brings us to the end of our session. Um, would an A grade, so I'm assuming here, would a predicted A in chemistry be a disadvantage compared to predicted A star? I don't think we're too worried about the fine detail of predictions. Predictions, I think it's something, even in a good year, which obviously this isn't, um, I think something like for only 47% of predictions turn out to be correct. Um, so we're not really going to be distinguishing much between A's and A stars uh, in predictions. I mean, if your predictions are sort of way off what we're looking for, um, then obviously that might ring some alarm bells. But by that stage, we'd have your BMAT score anyway. Um, so that would be my answer for that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, although I say chemistry is an important predictor, I wouldn't say that all of our students have got A stars in chemistry. You know, you're, it, we want A star, A star, A, and your A could be in chemistry. I just think your, your life will be easier if you find that you're a natural with chemistry. But again, we, we, our we've got so many students, we have a whole variety of people who've got different strengths. And that's one of the beauties about a college system is that if you've got one person in the year who's really good at the maths, but very good at, very bad at the anatomy, there'll be somebody else that, who will help them with the anatomy and then they can help them with the maths. Um, somebody's asked, does having medical work experience in the current situation um, give you an advantage over other candidates? And I think we've answered that. The answer yeah. is, is no, because at the moment we know that it's impossible for many people to get, to get work experience. Um, another question is, Gibbs a good reflective structure for personal statement writing? Um, I would say don't worry about researching a style for writing a personal statement. If you're putting in the things that you've done, the things you're interested in, um, in, and what you've learned from those, that's, that's good for us. We don't need you to, to go off and look at a certain structure. I certainly, um, until do my job now, hadn't even heard of Gibbs and only have heard about Gibbs from year 12 students asking me um, similar questions. Yeah, I, I was about to say, I'm glad you heard of what it was because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I only know from people asking me a similar question. Um, there's no thing that says you I, I would, as David said, ask, ask these questions at the, at the medical schools who really care about we, we would never deselect you for interview uh, based on your personal statement just what isn't going to happen um, whereas some other medical schools might so find out what they want and f and just for the part for us also when you do the cambridge application there's a little bit to say something extra about cambridge uh, you might want to say that you've been to a cambridge seminar st catherine's and you were really excited by it and then throw in a few facts that you want me to ask you about. I'm really interested in this part. I'm really interested in this. This is my EPQ. That's all I care about. I, I'm not, but I'm not going to deselect you based on a bad personal statement because I don't know who wrote it. Okay, that brings us to the, to the end of our questions. We got through about 130 questions there. So thanks very much to our students and to Stefan and David um, and Megan who were busy typing away in the background as well. We hope you found this useful. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions and you're thinking, oh, I wish I got a chance to ask that, feel free to email our admissions office. We can always pass on questions to students um, or to Stefan if he has the time. So thanks very much, everyone, and have a lovely week, both our helpers and those who attended today. Bye.